Hi, good evening, everybody, and welcome to What Does Inclusive Education Look Like in Practice? Um, from its inception, the Down Syndrome Association has been at the forefront of um, the drive towards greater inclusion in education. We had countless campaigns over the years, some really successful campaigns, and um, we've always been there to support students and um, education professionals along the way. In 2020, the DSA collaborated with Down Syndrome International on the production of education guidelines for international learners. We have two of the authors here tonight. Um, following the publication of those guidelines, we carried out a campaign to find out just what was happening in the UK. We spoke to parents, we spoke to schools, and we spoke to education professionals. And we gathered an awful lot of information. I'm delighted to say that Sharon Smith has now joined the Down Syndrome Association and Sharon um, is working with all that information and data that we have and gathering more. And we, you'll probably have noticed that this webinar is part of a campaign that Sharon has been working on. And we will be working well into 2024 with more um, information and um, gathering uh, uh, more evidence as we go. And who knows? Who knows where we'll get to with it, but it'd be great. We have some great speakers here this evening, and uh, I hope you enjoy the evening. And I'll hand over to Sharon. Sharon. Thank you, Carol. And welcome, everybody, to this evening's session. Um, so in terms of how the session is going to work, um, I'm delighted this evening to welcome um, Gillian Bird from the DSA, um, Rhonda. Um, Sarah, Abby, who is here on behalf of Lindsay, and she will explain um, about that shortly, and also Nicole as well. Um, and I'm going to get everybody to introduce themselves. We've got um, three questions that each person is going to answer. Um, then we've got the Q&A session, and then there will be a final summing up key message from everybody too. Um, so I would like to um, invite all of our panellists. Um, and I'm going to start with Jill, um, and then I will say who, who will come next, um, to tell us your name, your role, and what your interest is, um, either organisational interest or personal interest in inclusion. So, Jill, if you could go first. Okay, so I'm Gillian. I'm the Services Director for the Down Syndrome Association. I'm fortunate to have worked with children of Down syndrome, families and schools in both research and practice for 38 years. My experience includes developing early intervention services and inclusive education and training for primary and secondary schools. So I continue to manage DSA services, which includes information and our help plan and training, among other things. Um, so do, you know, have a feel for what's coming in uh, to us. We have more than 10,000 calls annually. And of course, many of those are about education. That's it. Thank you. Um, so next on my list is Rhonda. Rhonda Hi, over to you. Thanks, Sharon. Yes, I'm Rhonda Farragher. I'm from the University of Queensland, where I'm a professor of inclusion and diversity. But um, it's a long road to that particular position and I'm a maths teacher by background and 27 years ago I had my daughter Ruth with Down syndrome and I knew not a thing about how to teach her maths and I was particularly concerned about that and uh, I've worked ever since to make maths accessible to people with Down syndrome. We also had the um, mix of joy and complete despair through her education at various times and shared that joy and despair with her teachers 
and and the schools. So we've we've had a variety of experiences as a family, and I work alongside teachers now who are doing the really important work of responding to learners' needs, and um, it's a a real joy and a privilege to do that. And at the moment, I'm coming to you not from that beautiful city behind me. I'm coming from a very other beautiful city, um, the cold and dark Stirling in the in central Scotland. So you couldn't be further away, one would have thought. But um, I'm enjoying my time there and with you all tonight. Thanks, Sharon. Thanks, Wanda. And next on my list is Sarah. Um, hi, my name's Sarah, Sarah Geiger. Um, I've worked as a primary school teacher, a secondary school teacher, and as an educational psychologist in local authorities for um, 36 years. Um, so, um, well, as an educational psychologist, I've worked strategically and practically um, to support schools and children and young people with Down syndrome. Um, in their experience and in their um, success and learning across the local authority schools. Um, and um, in the period from 2019 to 2021, um, I carried out research about what works for our children with um, 200 families in the UK. Um, and now um, I work as an educational psychologist providing supervision to schools and local authority leaders. That's my role at the moment. Thanks, Sarah, and we're delighted you're with us too. And Abby, could I ask you to introduce both yourself and also Lindsay, please? Yes, good idea. Hello, everyone. My name's Abby. I'm an information officer here at the DSA, um, and I work with people who have Down syndrome um, in lots of different ways. And one of those ways is with the Our Voice team. Um, they are a group of people who have Down syndrome who help the DSA with our work. Uh, and Lindsay is one of the people on the Our Voice team, and she wasn't available to be with us uh, in person, so we recorded her answers um, yesterday. So bear with me as I share Lindsay's that each time uh, it's her turn to answer. So hopefully you can hear her introduction. My name is Lindsay Shearer. I am a member of the DSA Our Voice Group, and I am interested in talking to you about inclusive education. Thank you, Abby. Um, we felt it was really important, um, even though Lindsay couldn't be here this evening, now, obviously, we hear from somebody who has Down syndrome and who is a member of our voice um, in the session and is able to be presented through Abby um, and the video that has already been made. So we look forward to hearing from Lindsay. And that brings me to our um, last but not least um, panellist, um, Nicole. Hi, I'm Nicole Dempsey. I'm currently Director of Send and Safeguarding for Dixon's Academies Trust which is a schools trust of 17 schools across Leeds, Bradford, Manchester and Liverpool. Um, all mainstream, primary, secondary, all through in sixth form. Um, and I came to this role, um, I, I became a teacher specifically because I wanted to be a Senko and I wanted to be a Senko because from my experience in special schools and my own experience of education, at that point, I'd kind of identified that children without additional needs in mainstream were doing pretty much OK and children with special educational needs in special schools were getting a pretty good deal. But children with special educational needs in mainstream schools were getting a pretty terrible deal and I wanted to contribute to doing something about that. So I'll, I'll speak more specifically about, about how that's gone when we start answering the questions, uh, but my my what what i'm aiming to achieve is a truly inclusive education for all children we're really at the beginning of our journey supporting children with down syndrome at our trust so we're at an interesting point um and 
you know, looking to learn and develop and, and take that opportunity as it comes to us. Thank you, Nicole. And we're delighted that you're we're here with us as well this evening. And so I'm going to move on. We're, we're slightly ahead, two minutes ahead of where we wanted to be, but I'm sure that we will um, catch up on that. So the next question is, and this is for everybody, um, what does inclusive education mean to you? Um, we're very aware that um, inclusive education is highly contested as a concept, and it can mean many things to many people. And um, so in terms of what it means to you, and this time I'm going to start with Lindsay, if that's OK, Abby. It certainly is. I was just realising that I cut Lindsay off too early just now. So we're going to say why it's important and then what it means to her. Because I want people with Down syndrome to have what I had and being able to go into mainstream schools and get the support that I got. Inclusive education means to me that I'm able to go to the same school as my brother and my friends. And I also I also get I'm also able to take part in the same kind of lessons and activities. Thank you. And we got a sneak preview of the next question there. I did. <laughs> um, so, um, Nicole. So, uh, like I said before, I, uh, I came into education to do something very specific. Um, and even though I started my career as an NQT and then uh, my first years as a SENCO in a very traditional school, I then had the opportunity to be the first Senko in a startup free school that was opening for the first time. One of many um, startup free schools that have maybe not taken the opportunity that I think they have um, to not um, make the same mistakes that are now so ingrained and embedded in mainstream education in general and, and do something different and do something exciting and interesting but we really wanted to take that opportunity so i've spent a lot a lot of the last 10 years thinking really carefully about what inclusive education is and what it means to me and and what that needs to look like um and what we decided 10 years ago is that we wanted a school that didn't need inclusion because you to be included you need to have first been excluded and we wanted to, we had this opportunity to design a school from scratch and we wanted to design it with the full broad range of needs that we knew we would be getting without segregation, segregation of space or service, without segregation of ex expectation. And as children joined year on year um, and the needs increased and we, we became quite um, well known. So we, it's got a, a lot of children with additional needs um that instead of looking at alternative pathways and additionality and interventions we would always be self-reflective look at ourselves and change the school as a whole to broaden the the main offer as much as possible what that looks like in practicality what that looks like in reality is a school that doesn't have all of the things that you would necessarily expect to see as the artifacts of inclusion so there is no SEND department, for instance, there's no space in the school that's for SEND or inclusion. Um, there's no teaching assistants or similar. There's no withdrawal from lessons. But in order to make that work, to make that so that every child can go to the lesson and, and be taught directly by the teacher, that they don't have to be pulled out, that if they need something, they go to a support service that's there for everyone and can meet needs holistically using a multidisciplinary approach there are things that you wouldn't necessarily be looking for but are absolutely there so there's there's more staff there's more teachers per class for instance uh, there's we we approach cpd very differently and we have our jewel in the crown the multidisciplinary pastoral department that is there for every child equally 
however much or little they need it and there is absolutely safe quiet spaces that children can go and there's absolutely one-to-one -one and there's absolutely intervention and support but it does look very different um, and that's been that's been really successful we've we've got um we've got really good outcomes we our children with additional needs are proportionally represented in behaviour data, attendance data, rewards, they're on student council. It's also been a huge learning curve and I think one of the things that has become most important to us over the year is that we really reject the idea that what we're trying to do is create an environment where everyone's the same and everyone gets the same and really promote this idea that we want a culture and a system that where you can be different and if you're getting something different if you're the one child in the class that doesn't you know that that has a an ipad or a certain resource or certain level of support that that just isn't questioned or seen as a stigma or problematic or, or interesting in any way and that we have systems that we, you know we have we have known if anything for being quite strict for instance we absolutely have a behavior system and all the things that you would expect to see in a school but intentionally designed to be broad and flexible, responsive, restorative, and in, and most importantly, nurturing and kind. Um, and now I no longer work specifically for that school, but for the trust and the challenge is how can we take what we've learned from that to benefit children in schools that are much more established and are much more traditional and where we hear lots of kind of negative school stories about our most vulnerable children getting the worst treatment still even 10 15 years after i started this journey myself oh thank you i think it's really um helpful to hear that it can it can happen and that inclusion absolutely can happen in practice which is what we're here for this evening so thank you for sharing that um i'm going to move on now to jill please oh, thank you that was great, Nicole. Very refreshing. Very difficult for me to follow. <laughs> anyway, for what does inclusion mean to you? For every child and family to be welcomed, so family as well, as an equally valued member of their community, school, and for all staff and service providers to understand that it is their right to be there and to belong. I'd like the benefits of inclusive education to be understood by everyone and for educators to feel confident in their ability to deliver an inclusive education for everyone and to know that they'll be supported helped to do that um, I've obviously seen many many children through from starting school to leaving college um, well, sometimes, you know, you get some little, of course you get some issues along the way to be solved, but it doesn't feel that difficult to do. And I guess I'm a little concerned, less concerned now I've heard, Nicole, that we've got stuck and things haven't really gone forward in the way that I think they should have done, given the length of time I've been doing this. Thank you. And Rhonda? Yeah, I know what you mean, Jill. I had, um, you know, feeling like, gee whiz, you know, when I see families seeing like um, one of the, the chat comment from Toyam, you know, the same thing was put to us when our daughter was, you know, in year one or two or something or other. And, uh, and you think, gosh, are we still going through that same yeah. thing? And we are. And that's a shame. But um, in terms of what inclusion means to me, um, I, I'm, I think, Sharon, it, when you started by saying it's a contested term, I think we need to move from that. I think it is a really well-established term now, general comment number four from the UN Convention on the Rights of People with Disability gave us the definition. And, and I think there's, yes, there are people who are yet to understand it, but that doesn't mean that there isn't a definition it could well be that people don't understand Pythagoras' theorem, but it does exist. And if you work on it, you can come to understand it. And I think it's the same with inclusion. And for me, it's as what Lindsay said, you know, she, she's there doing the work that other kids are 
getting the support she needs. But it's irrelevant that Lindsay has a disability. And that's the key thing in the UN definition, that disability actually isn't mentioned in inclusive education. And I think that's exactly the way it should be. We meet this, the needs of all the learners. And that could be learners who've got, well, all of us come with learning support needs. So it is about that. Mm. Thank you. I was just looking away then trying to get general comment for so that I could find it and put it in the chat, which I am going to do so that anybody who wants to read that can have a look at that definition. So thank you, Rhonda. Um, and I'm going to move yeah, probably, on. Probably, to... sorry, I might just say that perhaps the Alana um, information and the information in the guidelines have the Alana has the diagram that is very mm -hmm. helpful and our guidelines have reproduced that definition yeah. so and I have, you've probably I have found what the they've guidelines. probably found yeah that's right that you've already yeah. sent the link for the guidelines so, but I will I will put the guidelines back in again and, and just say for I'll, I'll say which page it's on so that you can have a look at that um wonderful thank you and over to Sarah um yeah so what is inclusion I mean at its most basic inclusion is about being allowed access you allow me to attend, you don't keep me out, or you don't get me out at the first opportunity or the second or the third. Um, but I suppose for me, really, inclusion is about belonging. This is my place. This is where I fit. And you want me here because this is where I belong. That, to me, is what inclusion is. However, I'm cautious about this focus on individual children putting the weight of responsibility on our families and our children it, you know that has this placement been successful has this placement not been successful um i actually don't like to see inclusion in terms of the rights of the individual i think that inclusion is about the rights of the majority and i'll, I'll give you two examples of what i mean um firstly well as our school community how do we educate our children in terms of what's important, in terms of what's important as a citizen, um, as, a, as a member of a community? One, one of the, I've done some systematic literature reviews which are looking at what works in different situations. And one of them was about what combats prejudice and, um, uh, and disability hate crime. What can we see schools do that, um, that, actually makes changes um, and looked um, at research um, across different countries any um, research that was in English I looked at um, and really what we see is what intervention can schools do well the intervention with the most impact on our children and young people on all our children and young people it is frequent opportunities for positive social interaction with um, in the case of a disability with people with disabilities so what we're looking what we need to look at is promoting our school communities that allow positive social interaction and you're not going to get that if our children aren't there um, and then if i give you a, a second example of why i don't want to focus i don't like the focus on on the individual it's too much pressure for the individual and it's too much pressure for the individual family it's not their responsibility it's the responsibility of of our schools and our leaders. So the second impact of inclusion on a school community, um, including, for example, our children with Down syndrome, is it reminds us and it supports us to know there are different ways to be a person and there are different ways to live a life and that's okay. And I think it's very important for our children and our young people, all of our children and young people, to be reminded of that when they're being squashed into sort of sausage making machines in, in school and, 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 a, and across their lives in terms of who must I be. Um, so that's what I mean really about thinking about the school community and impact on the school community. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you all of you for your answers to that. Um, so we're moving on to the next question, um, which I'm going to try and tie in some of the comments that we're also receiving in the chat as well. 
as I answer, as I ask this question. So um, the question is, in your experience, what are the biggest barriers to the successful inclusion of pupils who have Down syndrome in mainstream education? Um, and, but before I allow you to answer that question um, I just want to draw attention really to the fact that we've we've had some messages so um, we've had a message from I think it's Toyin um, just saying that um, their, their daughter's school is pushing actually for them to go to special specialist provision and um, we also have got um, somebody else has just messaged in saying that the local mainstream secondary has said that they can't meet um, their daughter's needs um, but also the local special school um, has said it can meet need but that's not their choice that's not what they're wanting at the moment um, and then somebody else is saying that mainstream schools are saying that they're not necessarily going to get funding to be able to be inclusive so um, I just wanted to bring those in but also to hear from you what your experiences are what your thoughts are as to what the biggest barriers are to inclusion at the moment. So um, I'm going to start with Rhonda this time. Yes, thanks, Sharon. And haven't we seen some in that chat? Yeah, um, I was going to say, for me, the biggest barrier was a, a sense that somebody out there knows how to do this better than I as the teacher knows. And I certainly felt that when I was um, teaching and also when I went looking to help Ruth I just kept thinking someone knows the special trick and that the, in the work that I've done with some really outstanding teachers it just strikes me that a good teacher has all the skills they need it's about creativity it's about thinking what's blocking my student from learning and working creative ways around that block and you don't find a special trick to do that it's knowing that student it's thinking about what the barrier to their learning is and you can see that in these responses of schools oh we we can't do that but that special school down the road they'll have the special trick or oh we we need extra funding because we'll need one-on-one -on -one because we can't possibly do this in our classroom and those sorts of resources and all those other um, excuses for me are really crying out to say, we don't think we have the expertise when the evidence in research would suggest that people actually do have the expertise, but they perhaps lack the confidence. And that's where support from organisations like Down Syndrome UK can come to the fore to support people while they develop that expertise. Thank you, Rhonda. And absolutely, and I think that's one of the things that has been a, a sort of central aim of trying to do this campaign is to start some of those conversations and to say actually some of it is not necessarily about, as you say, their specialist interventions or specialist training, but to try and give confidence. Um, Sarah, over to you next. Um, so barriers. Um, I think a big barrier is a lack of understanding about um, how children and young people with Down syndrome learn and the importance um, and the, the pleasure of learning through social interaction, um, learning through um, being with a range of children with all the needs that children have in terms of um, progress and in terms of noticing um, and modelling and doing what other people around you are doing, which I think is really, really important um, to our children and young people. Um, but if I'm thinking about barriers, I think that a real barrier is that to me, I feel that the purpose of education has been really narrowed in the last 12 years. So if we think that um, we've moved away from an agenda which is saying 
every child matters, which is a very inclusive statement. And when you think about um, the priorities um, under that um, purpose of education, very clear purpose of education, it sits so well for our children, you know, be healthy, stay safe, enjoy, achieve, achieve, make a positive contribution, achieve economic well-being, all of those factors um, were things that sat so comfortably for um, for what we wanted um, f for our children and young people. Um, and unfortunately, I think that a, a raising standards agenda, which really pushes teachers through a, a, a narrowing of the curriculum and and an emphasis on performance data analysis um, creates a pressure in our system which um, makes things for all of our children and young people very fast paced. As an educational psychologist, I would say developmentally inappropriate often or developmentally inadequate um, for many children um, from reception onwards. Um, so I think that that has created a lot of pressure and I think that that the vision for education and the um, toothpaste tube of education is, is perhaps our biggest difficulty at the moment. Thank you, Sarah. And now, Abby, could we hear from Lindsay? Absolutely. my opinion, the biggest barriers are that schools and staff are unaware of how capable people with Down syndrome can be. And teachers and teaching assistants don't have enough experience of working with children with Down syndrome. Thank you, Lindsay and Abby. Um, next is Nicole, and then we'll come to Jim. So, Nicole. Um, so, like I said, we're, we've, we've been on a, a quite a journey with inclusivity in general, but we're at the beginning of our journey with Down syndrome specifically. I, I, mean, I won't go into detail why, but our schools in other cities are the ones that are newer to the trust. We're most established in Bradford, which has historically been very traditional. And it's only really in the last few years we're seeing higher need and uh, different diagnoses coming into our mainstream schools. On a practical level, the the first barrier and it really does reflect it really does reflect what everyone has already said is that when senkos and school leaders see the words down syndrome on the ehcp or on the consultation they're immediately on the back foot and challenging them to read the ehcp read the reports that are available as part of that consultation as if they hadn't seen that it said Down syndrome and how would they be receiving that same information describing a child's academic levels and, and the strengths and the difficulties and, and what they're working on and the strategies which are unique to that child's way of learning but so too were pretty much every EHCP consultation that we receive we would be getting to know that child and what they need as an individual meeting them where we're where they're at gathering as much information as possible and and doing our best until we kind of build that relationship and are able to contribute to that decision making process ourselves. but there's something about seeing not necessarily specifically down syndrome but a, a specific um term or diagnosis that is that I think comes to people already loaded with meaning, um, assumption based meaning, but meaning non nonetheless. And as people have been speaking, and as I was reflecting on my own answer to this question, I kept coming back to the scope disability perception gap report, which is a piece of research that I often return to. If it's not something that you've seen, I would recommend that you have a look at it. 
and the the research about inclus inclusivity in education is there but i often kind of look beyond um what's available about education and inclusion in education at what what we can find about adult society and from outside the sector and th this isn't about inclusive education it's about dis disability in society in general but i think it's really important to education because what they have mainly found is um posit positive attitudes towards disability difference diversity increases with proximity to disability and diversity and the some of the some of the findings of the report are, qu are, are quite upsetting to be quite frank but probably most crucially that people that don't know anyone with a disability are five times more likely to perceive them as getting in the way so uh, mirroring what other people have already said when we have segregated education systems whether that is because the we've got such a kind of uh, binary school system of mainstreams all doing the same thing in the same way gcse exam factories and special schools that uh, we're robbing our children of the opportunity to learn what what a great thing it is to live in a diverse society where everyone you meet is different and can bring something different and unique and special to the table but even in our schools it it happens on a um, on a classroom level or within our own building. So even schools that uh, you know have high incidence of children with additional needs, have children with Down syndrome, there still is often a level of segregation within the school that again is robbing our children, our children with diagnoses, our children without, our children with SEN, our children that are not identified as SEN, of a really great opportunity to learn firsthand that it's fine. It's fine. It's absolutely normal. It can be done. Um, and it also robs our teachers of that experience. So as soon as they see the word Down syndrome, they're like, oh, not me. This is not something I deal with because they've never had the experience of that being fine. So the, there is really only one way to address that, though I realise that is the next question. Something that uh, another thing that's really important to me about the approach we've taken at my school, and it is in some of the other Dixon schools, and it has been adopted by some non Dixon schools as well, is I don't necessarily think that my school is right for every child. That's not relating to whether they have an additional need or not. It is parent choice whether they want to sign up to what, what we offer. But it is that word choice that is most important to me. What we have created in our little bit of Bradford is a little bit of choice for our families. There is one school, there's actually a few of us, but schools that are doing things a little bit differently. And that gives parents the opportunity to say whether they want this mainstream school or that mainstream school, as opposed to it being all mainstreams that are all kind of pushing in the same direction in the same way. Um, and I think that is that is probably that is probably one of the things that needs to change that we we need to create more diversity and more choice so that every school not every school is going to be right for every child but once a child is in a school that their needs can be met as part of the main of what is happening and the children can learn and thrive alongside each other and that then this creates the conditions for a better future according to scopes research where people have learned firsthand that that is something that absolutely can work and is positive. Nicole, thank you. Um, I'm going to pass to Jill and then again, I'm going to come back and just mention a couple of things that have come in the, the comments as well. So Jill, over to you. OK, so I have attitude and willingness to include as a barrier and um, some school staff view includes inclusion as an option for them, an option, um, and it's from their goodwill that they will meet additional needs rather than knowing it's their job. And some educators may lack an understanding of learning disability or developmental delay. So some don't expect additional needs, which may be significant or complex, to be present alongside having Down syndrome. So I'm probably going in a different direction. They think they have a person with Down syndrome, but that's it, you know. Um, 
and they may have a preconceived about how the child will a preconceived idea about how the child will progress and if the child doesn't progress in that way for example at a similar rate of progress relative to their average peers then they think the placement is no longer suitable and they don't see inclusion as long term okay Thank you. Um, so just really wanted to um, make sure we don't miss out on some of the comments that are coming in. Um, and it may well be things that we can reflect on either in the Q&A or in your answers to the next um, the next sort of question. But we're, we've got people saying that um, it was really interesting to hear Lindsay um, talking about sort of low expectations. Um, I think there's a couple of people have responded here about that, just saying that often schools don't have um, high expectations or an understanding of the strengths and the capabilities. Um, so what children and young people who have Down syndrome can do and what they can go on to achieve. So um, I think Lindsay's comments in particular um, have really resonated with people. Um, and there's also um, just a comment here from someone saying that um, there's a, a daughter who is five in year one um, supported by a local charity and the, the TA comes um, to the sessions that are run by the charity and has seen the difference in what actually the child is achieving there compared to in school. So the, the work that's being pitched at school is, is potentially too easy um, and they could do a little bit more. Um, and then we've just got um, another, somebody's put in the Q&A, just saying um, potentially a barrier is the refusal of educational establishments of all levels, so primary, secondary, mainstream and special, um, to listen to parents, so that's one thing, also to engage in training and support from organisations such as the DSA as well. So not, I guess, wanting to um, accept or, or be willing to show that they don't necessarily know everything and can learn from either the parents or from other organisations like the DSA. So potentially that's also another barrier. Um, and saying, you know, disability laws on inclusion are brilliant on paper, not necessarily happening in practice consistently or consistently enough. And I guess if it was happening in practice consistently enough, we probably wouldn't be here this evening having this event talking about this because we would all be celebrating that inclusion instead. So um, on to question three. Um, and we are perfect on time for this. So. Um, we've obviously talked about lots of barriers and um, there have been barriers that you've all raised and also people who are in the audience in the um, webinar this evening have raised. So we're now moving on to how do you think that the barriers that have been mentioned can be overcome in practice? So what we don't want to do is just say, well, this is all doom and gloom um, and, you know, it's it's too difficult, it's too challenging. What can we do? <laughs> what can parents do? And um, what can educators do as well to actually turn this around? So I'm going to start this time with Sarah. Um, so what I'd like to do is really share with you um, feedback from um, the parents um, that I worked with uh, about the question of what has worked to support your child um, in school. Um, this would be really um, children and young people between the ages of five to, to 16. I didn't go further because it often becomes more bespoke then, so I wanted something more general. So this is really um, bringing together um, what these families have said ha has worked for them and their child um, in supporting their education and um, what I've done really is, is put it into the two themes of, of what we really need to make things work the first being um, as I mentioned before belonging so the child the child the young person they know where they fit they know that they have a place the difference is allowed and they are enjoyed really so along that theme what actually works practically um, was was we were asked. So yes, as mentioned before, training. 
Um, I mean, definitely the basics in training in terms of um, our children's specific profile, their physical needs, their sensory needs, um, that training really reviewed annually as staff change. If we were going to become more bespoke and the school was going to be more ambitious, we'd want curriculum and teaching methods, um, reading teaching methods, which is hugely important because many of our children really develop their language through learning to read and, and through a very visual approach. Um, speech and language development and interventions and how we support our children's social and emotional development. So when we're thinking about belonging training, transition, I think, is, is hugely important. How our children are prepared. Um, our children often don't like to be in a situation where they're not quite sure what's going on and um, that can cause our children quite a lot of distress and and um, and a key strategy can be refusal um, when I don't know what I'm meant to be doing and don't know what's happening, don't know what happens next. Um, so really a plan to support the welcome, transition into school, um, across year groups, daily transitions being supported with um, visual materials, um, an end of year transition, focusing on what works, attainment levels, personal needs. Um, then thinking about transition um, at year five and at year 10 um, um, into secondary school and then really approaching adulthood um, and helping our children in their um, their goals and their aspirations for adulthood. Um, included in that, I suppose, as part of transition, there'd be um, purposeful work experience um, in, in secondary, really starting from year nine in terms of our children having a purpose. Um, if I'm going to belong, I need to know that I've got a purpose, I've got a reason, and I've got things that I do and I give. Um, also in terms of belonging is our communication, focusing on communication. So um, communication support plan, ideally next steps for communication skills identified within the teaching plan, um, signing, signing basics for key staff. Um, I, I see um, people using um, signing as a real support, especially at times of change, high stress, and it being a very helpful and soothing um, communication long after um, I may be able to um, communicate um, using words. Um, home school communication can be absolutely dire and a rod to beat the teacher with or the parent with, um, really. So focusing on content so that the parent can support discussion and positive feedback with their child at home, know what's going on, back, back up, and then communicate to schools so that schools also know, know what's happening. Um, and I would say independence right from the start. Um, so right from when our children are little, we have at least one activity which is incorporated daily um, that um, is focusing on our, our, our children's independence, their next small steps towards independence across the spectrum, eating, drinking, um, going to the toilet, going around the school, dressing, being with their peers, um, thinking about um, travel, um, thinking uh, uh, because we're wanting our um, children and young people to be able to take opportunities and um, for their next steps into adulthood as well. So um, an independence, responsibility for friendships, movement around the school. Um, and then I would say peers, um, friendships. Um, I did some interviews with um, young people with Down syndrome, um, which were very visual interviews. People didn't need to be able to communicate in words um, to be able to um, how to be interviewed, we used a lot of visual methods. Um, and friendship came out as a, a really important thing for the young people that were interviewed. Friendship and social relationships, I think that's something um, that's, that's very dear um, and really important. I think that friendship can be different for people with Down syndrome, especially for less verbal people with Down syndrome. 
um, and that's important for us to think about because sometimes um, we can be quite rigid about what we think friendship is and I've heard people say well, they're not real friends and um, and I think that we have to be very cautious about that that's not necess that's not coming from our children young people and that's not coming from an understanding potentially of different types of, of, of friendships and, and important of friendship of importance of friendships so I do think that, that um, we need a very big um, and um, planned um, emphasis on, on, on our peers, um, supporting peers who, are, who can be guided um, in terms of our children's need, factual responsibilities, preparation for tough questions, teaching kindness, teaching sensitivity to others, asking before helping, all of those sorts of things, as well as our children being included, um, sex and relationship education being differentiated, etc. Um, also with social interaction. Another thing that came up in the interviews with young people are the importance of short breaks. Um, a, a school environment is a very centrally overpowering environment. And um, in all the interviews, the importance of little breaks and longer breaks. And um, if I'm eating, I want to eat. Please don't talk with me or whatever. That is important to that young person. So the social emotional support to stay okay in the school environment um behavior routines being recognized being taught what to do when things go wrong um having those sorts of plans um age appropriate expectations so um age and and developmental appropriate so that our children aren't baby treated as younger a 14 year old is a 14 year old um although obviously we're thinking about social emotional next steps um, and the importance of visual materials to know what I'm meant to be doing and where I am and understand, not loads and loads of language. Sarah, I'm really sorry. I'm going yeah. to have to interrupt you. I didn't want to stop because you've just got so many amazing ideas. And but I, I do need to move on. And I'm really sorry. And there was a message in the chat that has gone, but it was just asking if you could um, put details of your research into the chat so that people can have a look at that. That would be really helpful. Yes, yeah, Sharon, put... actually you've put, um, um, I've, I've made a summary of that research, an accessible summary for schools, which is a very honed down, and this is what you need to do for, for schools. And that's on the DSA. Um, that's, website. I've put a link for that. Yes, yes. yes. So yeah. thank you, Sarah. Um, I am gonna have to move on, but Sorry you're very on. welcome to reply in the chat. Um, so the next person is Lindsay. Um, so, Abby, Lovely. over to you. Thank you, Sharon. And just to say that I am, I am copying your comments to Lindsay um, from the chat. So if you have any um, response to anything that she's saying, um, do do put those down, and I'll I'll copy them and um, send them to her tomorrow. We can overcome the barriers by making sure our teaching assistant and other staff have the right training so that they can work with children with Down syndrome. Thank you, Abby. And yes, absolutely. Please do pass on our thanks to Lindsay because we are incredibly grateful to her for making the time to answer the questions for this evening. So thank you very much. Um, Nicole. Um, I think for me, I, I can only speak as an educator, not uh, no expertise or really much experience in, in supporting children with Down syndrome. But when I think about my own experience of educate of working in education at the minute it is a really kind of dizzying mix of really promising new research guidance that feels like it's really saying the right things not just in the world of send but in all those kind of complicated complex overlaps that um the world of sen and inclusion has with behavior and safeguarding and teaching and learning alongside a, a kind of more despair and things seeming more rigid than ever and staffing being tighter and funding being problematic and it is really it can be really difficult to be positive and um see how things 
could possibly land successfully even when people are saying the right things and the research and evidence is pushing us in the right direction but when i when i bring it back down to its core what i think is the actual problem and what needs to change is that education has become very rigid and we can think about that in terms of the exam factory and that certainly is you know, a factor but also education schools and education existed for a lot a, existed long before the concept of inclusion or integration as it as we called it initially and what we're effectively doing is bringing a wider range of needs into a system that wasn't really well designed in the first place but we really wedded to it so when schools are presented with what they perceive to be a new challenge whether that's whether they're perceiving correctly or not what they're trying to do is fit a child into a school that they've already designed and we need to flip the narrative, turn that on its head and realise that the school is not the building or the routines or the system. The school is the children. The children that are on role at the time of the school and the routines and systems and environment needs to change and evolve to meet the needs of the group of children that are in it at any one time. And in a couple of years, that group of children might look different. Um, and then the school needs to change and evolve to meet the needs of those children. Um, and that is that is a that is difficult to to land with staff, and um, especially because that is not supported by the wider system or the the structures that surround us at the LA and at the DFE. Um, but it is possible, and a lot of the things that we do or don't do at our schools, where that are a little bit different to the norm actually lean into research and evidence and guidance and law much more closely than schools that are doing things that are much more recognisable um, but don't really represent really kind of key concepts in education like all teachers are teachers of SEND, um, every child should be able to go to the local mainstream school, parents should have choice these everyone knows these phrases but these are not what is reflected in our really typical traditional systems i don't know how we make that happen i know i know how to make it happen in my school and i think a lot of it were you know luck uh, being in the right place at the right time um but one one thing that i think is particularly powerful is cpd staff training not just about um, practical strategies and, and knowledge that, that our teachers and leaders need, but talking about talking to them about an ethos and values and the importance of relationships and belonging and the psychology of belonging and all of these things that underpin um, really everything that we're trying to achieve in education, but particularly inclusivity. And that can be particularly powerful and that is something that we are in control of within our schools for people like me that is something that we can choose to do and um, when i look at initial teacher training the early careers framework and the mpq suite all i see is opportunities missed where so many staff across education are accessing these reputable courses and sources um, and they're not particularly following the research and, and evidence that would move the sector forward without there really needing to be any drastic changes to law or guidance because it's all already out there. So I don't think that's a very uh, tangible uh, next step for anyone, but, but those are the things that would be important to me. Thank you, Nicole. Um, and then I'm going to come to Jill and then Rhonda after Jill. Okay. So better understanding of learning disability and Down syndrome, meaning, you know, training, knowledge, experience, um, sharing practice of uh, successful inclusion and including personal stories and lived experience. And I think it will help for education practitioners to have a good understanding of child development. And to know that good teaching and learning opportunities can bring great results and are just as important for learners who have a learning disability as for children who don't. Um, having delivered inclusive support services for school, 
I, did, I know the benefits of in-school advocacy for the child and family and professionals in this role usually advise on teaching and learning, inclusion, friendship, behaviour, curriculum, access, you know. They also feedback on progress and give reassurance. This role is still beneficial currently because people are finding it necessary and I would say unfortunately often necessary. Whereas if knowledge, skills and understanding were already embedded in teacher training and beliefs, I don't think the role would be necessary. So I'm not recommending that. I know that is what's happening now, still often supported, funded by local support groups. But I don't see it as a sustainable or systemic way to overcome the barriers. Um, lovely information that's been shared. Um, Thank you, Sarah and everyone. Um, and uh, of course, the, the uh, Down Syndrome International guidelines um, cover lots of the, the recommendations and key principles. And the, the Bardet Leading Edge group for Down Syndrome, the document that Sharon's put in the chat and the document that Sarah provided um, for the website. And, you know, the DSA provides training to thanks to and Rondi. yeah this is um how to overcome these barriers and and some of the things that have really struck me particularly in the comments um around the role of exams and you know people talking about the gcse or their schools being somehow um pulled down in rankings because of the performance of students with Down syndrome. And it, it strikes me, I mean, there will always be someone in the bottom of the class. And if it's not the child with Down syndrome because they weren't allowed to enrol, it's going to be some other kid that they didn't know would be the bottom of the class, but there will be somebody there. And it, it's just such a perversion of what we're about. It's a global problem. It's a significant problem in places like Singapore where they, their poor little poppets, even in primary school, have to get through their primary school exams to get into the next level and all sorts of things. And um, the sad thing is that it's not the only way, it's not the only valid way to assess learning. And you don't have to sit kids into an exam, but we just seem to have developed this system over the, the centuries in many places, and it's just sort of taken on. I um, grew up in a system, Queensland was one of the places in the world that didn't have external exams. We, we did have exams, but we had a lot of school-based assessment and it went on for decades. And then they had a review and they put the review out to somebody who was actually the, the um, person, there were a group, that actually published um, and ran external exams. So it's hardly a surprise that that was what the recommendation came out. And so Queensland, like everywhere else in the last few years, has gone over to external exams, which has had a terrible impact on the flexibility that education, um, that schools and teachers and the system had for supporting the adjustments of students with intellectual disability to show what they know and can do. So it's a terribly retrograde step. And I think it is something that as an international community, we've got to really work against because as Aviva said, she's absolutely right. Learning's not linear or hierarchical and learners, if they put these barriers in them, even in primary school, that they can't go on until you've passed this exam, you you know you're really allowing it where well, you're really saying that you can't have access to what is really important and we can show that you can meet the learning goals in some defensible way if you're given support doesn't mean to say you make the assessment so easy anyone can do it actually means that you support people to learn and then you assess what they can um, the other barrier that comes up is around, well, we can't afford it because we've got to employ a teacher aid one-on-one. -on -one. And that's come up in the 
comments and I uh, think it was somebody talking about that's an approach used in Northern Ireland. It's used around the world really and we need to give a lot more support to our teacher aides because there's an, an incredible expectation put on somebody who's not a qualified teacher to do some of the most complex teaching. You know, it just seems very um, counterintuitive and the research evidence really shows why that's a problem. And a better approach is not one-on-one support. The better approach is that a teacher is given the support and the teacher can use that support as they like. And I've seen teachers use... Um, a teacher aide, extra pair of hands in the classroom in really creative ways. I've got this wonderful photo of um, the teacher under the table with the student with Down syndrome, coaxing them out, helping them. Wasn't the teacher aide down there? The teacher aide was up just keeping her eye on everything else. It was that teacher building that relationship. Then I've seen them do things in an, in another way where it actually is the teacher aide who's just sort of not giving a lot of attention, settling that student in, helping them come into the class so that the teacher can keep working with the rest of the kids and then when the student's ready, away they go. So it's not that the teacher aide is being delegated all the responsibility to adjust learning and sometimes learning they don't know themselves. And that's one of the really big problems in the secondary school. And I see that coming up in the chat about in the secondary, we need one-on-one support. Well, if you're teaching secondary maths, you've got to make sure that the teacher aid is actually over on top of the mathematics. And often they're not because they don't have qualifications and they've not studied it. And for many that I've spoken with, they're absolutely terrified of having to teach the maths and it could be science in my case it'd probably be history or something if I had to teach it wouldn't know where to start so it's a a couple of things there in getting around barriers we've got to recognize the expertise of teachers we've got to really get to the idea that just employing person to teach take one-on-one is not the way to go but the big one I think globally we've got to tackle and we don't have really good solutions at this point is this pervasive examinations and um, the benchmarking of schools. Thank you, Rhonda. Um, I think that's everybody on that question. So we we're doing so well with time, and now we're not anymore. So we're going to have fifteen minutes for a Q&A, although I know we have been answering some of the comments as we've been going. Um, so I'm actually going to start right at the beginning um, just to ask um, on behalf of Veronica, um, she's saying, is there specific support or um, information available for pupils who have Down syndrome who are being home educated? Um, and is there support for them taking exams? as homeschoolers. Um, I haven't come across any information about that on the Down Syndrome Association website yet, but I'm also aware that I haven't read everything on there. So I'm just wondering from those of you that are on the call, um, do any of you have any particular knowledge or thoughts about home education for people who have Down Syndrome? Feel free as panellists just to now speak out. It's not in any particular order. Otherwise, I'll pick on somebody. (laughs) Well, um, I think we have calls and emails on this topic to our helpline. And uh, I'd have to look up what the information officers have looked up on our (laughs) wonderful anonymised log. Everything is confidential and anonymised log. To see that is the sort of question we get, and we would find out answers and um, give them to people. I don't have them off the top of my head, other than, you know, as we know, for lots of children, it's more uh, popular, particularly since COVID, because people did it and saw some benefits, I think. Or oh, schools become so uncomfortable for some children that, that, you know, they're happier, their families are happier doing that. Um, I mean, the obvious thing is, are we expecting you to become 
like teachers and um anyway i haven't got an answer for you <laughs> i need to so maybe that. maybe it's something that we can look to add yeah. on to the dsa website if we're getting a number of queries about it maybe it's just a page or resource or something i think i think we have some discussion on our closed facebook group occasionally too and abby might have something to add because you're on the coalface <laughs> yeah um i knew i'd um answered i uh, talked to some families about homeschooling and i am just on those logs now so possibly if no one else has anything to add maybe we could come back to this in a sec when i've um collated That'd be great thanks abby wonderful um, so let me just go through the questions. Um, how do you think there can be um, engagement um, or inclusion in um, local authority areas where there is a selective 11 plus system? So where we have um, grammar schools um, with exams where you have to um, obviously pass an exam to be able to go to a particular school. Does anybody have any thoughts on that, Sarah? Um, well, segregation um, off to grammar. So basically, you've got a certain percentage of children who've been sliced off, usually um, quite mirrored by their parents' socioeconomic group. Um, so you've got different factors at work. Um, interestingly, Schools that expect themselves to be schools that take a wider range of um, students and not necessarily um, students that they can cherry pick um, are, um, in my experience, often more open and tolerant and um, believe that it's their purpose to teach all the children um, within their um, community. And that can be very good for our children. Um, so, yes, there's segregation happening or there's cherry picking happening or there's um, spinning and certain children arriving in, in, in a certain type of school. Um, but the schools that that will take the, the majority <laughs> um, who, who aren't cherry picked um, are often really good choices for our children. That's what that's what I've found, um, and that's what um, quite a few of the parents, especially at secondary school, quite a few parents I've spoken to um, have been surprised at, and um, and also what our children have been able to offer in that environment. Um, so, for example, I was in in a school where. Um, a very um, economically deprived school and anything would make everything kick off and um, and one of our students in year nine she'd be telling everybody to get their books out and stuff and the children would all allow her to do that because that's what she did they didn't take it personally you know whereas if another person had said it they might not like it so our children often add to the school environment in a very unpredictable way and and um, and also a allow other children to think oh this is great and show um, their kindness and show their um, way that they can go out um, and accept and love um, and embrace mm. so it's fair yeah. I, what you were saying there really makes sense because the research is clear that schools that do inclusion well have better outcomes all over and it makes sense because if you are meeting the learning needs of the students you're not just thinking about particular students you actually part of your whole way of doing things is to support students so when you've got a selective system you're really up against it in a way it's another form of special school and if you're having those sorts of systems running then you are changing the way your whole system is. It's it, 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 There is such evidence, particularly in mathematics, around um, setting and the harm that does. And here's a school system that's putting it into practice. So 
all I can say is good luck. It really is important. Um, and if maybe um, consider standing for election. Thanks, Rhonda. And Nicole, before we move on to the next question, Nicole. This is not what I were originally going to say, but just in response to what Rhonda just said, we would consider ourselves to be a very inclusive school and we're also one of the top performing schools in the country at GCSE. So we're absolutely one of those schools, never excluded a child, no alternative pathways um, and consistently high progress across the board for Sendan for other children. What I were originally going to say though is our schools are most established in areas that don't have a grammar school system but there are still a few grammar schools where parents can choose and because they are part of the local authorities consultation for EHCPs just the same as any school because why wouldn't they be um, and there there, there will be exceptions to this but in the most part the grammar schools have really embraced that and they've got a reputation for being really inclusive and having some really exceptional provision. They've seen their environment as, again, another school that can offer genuine choice in the locality, where if you want a certain type of environment, that that's going to meet the needs of your, the, the specific needs of your child, then actually getting into one of the local grammars with an EHCP um, is, a, is a real positive choice in in our area and what those schools have done is they've taken some like genuine advantage around resource and capacity and used it to to build some really excellent provision um i'm not personally comfortable with the grammar school system i would do away with it but there is no doubt that the that it really does bring something to our local area where they have embraced inclusivity like they have and i can think of some really good examples thanks nicole um, I'm actually going to ask you the next question, um, Nicole, because I know you're going to know the answer, because I'm hoping it's going to be a yes or a no, or a very simple response. Um, so children who have um, Down syndrome or who have particularly complex um, needs in terms of their education needs, um, are they and their outcomes in terms of sitting exams and exam results included in schools published exam results i'm assuming they are and um, so i'm thinking around things like progress eight and all of those and um, because mm -hmm. somebody has been told that's why a local mainstream school has said their child can't attend so it, it, it unfortunately not a simple answer so they would be able okay, to go for it. it depends on whether they've got key stage two data because the progress is measured against the key stage two data. So children with no key stage two are not included in your progress, but they would be included in your attainment eight data, your A8. Um, and th of course, schools can apply for exemptions. So you would have to have a very good reason for, for having a child removed from your data, but that is something that is available in some circumstances. So the the answer is kind of either way. It depends on the school and individual circumstances and historical factors. Thank you. So they've put an extra question saying, is it best not to sit SATs then? <laughs> uh, I would I would um, think that would probably <laughs> down to individual circumstances as well. But for me personally, no. I think I think in most cases the there's no reason why they shouldn't sit sats if that's appropriate and sit some GCSEs if that's appropriate and sit in the data. <laughs> Thank you. And absolutely, there's there's nothing to say that, that children who are young people who have Down syndrome are not going to go on and, and achieve some GCSEs. Um, my, my daughter came up with a grade five um, art and design GCSE a couple of years ago, which is just absolutely wonderful. She's very, very proud of that. Um, so I'm very, very conscious of time. So, um, and we've suddenly had lots of questions coming in. And um, so we may not get to them. But the next question is, what are people's views about one-to-one -one support for people who have Down syndrome? That tends to be a big question, often comes up, I think. So um, does anybody want to take that? I'd just add that we do have a section in the guidelines on that. Mm. Okay, 
I will put the guidelines link in again. I have done it a couple of times, but I will I will put that back in. Thanks, Rhonda. Um, and then we can possibly move on unless anybody else has got any. I was just going to say we we are a school that don't have teaching assistants, learning support assistants, specifically fulfilling that role of kind of accompanying a child from lesson to lesson or sitting in the lesson and um, filtering the learning in some way. Um, however, we never say never. If we thought that that was the right thing for a child, in theory, we would do it. But we, whenever we've had that conversation, we've always decided that it's not the best thing that we can offer. What we do have is a big multidisciplinary team made up of mentors, key workers, therapists, carers, medical, uh, pastoral, all sorts of different specialists. So for some of our highest need children, when they're in lessons, they'd be supported by additional teachers that are in the room. If they need support with transition, their key worker might accompany them between lessons, working on skills to maybe withdraw that uh, over time. If they struggle at lunchtime, then they might have a mentor with them for part of lunchtime. But instead of it being a blanket teaching assistant or no teaching assistant, one-to-one -one or no one-to-one, -one, it's much more dynamic and considered right in this situation, who is the right adult to be providing that support? Where are our opportunities and where is there a need to provide something and what specifically is that thing that we need to provide? Thank you. I'm very aware of time, so I am going to um, put two questions together and hopefully we can answer these. So how do we encourage schools to engage in training, to engage in reading the research, to read the content that we've been producing on the DSA education campaign? to partner together and work together and to collaborate and to um, learn about inclusive best practice um, and how to, I guess, listen to parents as well in terms of um, listening, you know, around the child and, and learning about the particular child rather than having this blanket idea that this is what Down syndrome is. So how do we encourage schools to do this stuff? I guess we've we've been talking about how we can remove these barriers. How do we encourage the schools to actually take those steps? Can I jump in here? Um, I think when when we're parents and we know that things aren't going well, and we also know that there's something available and better, it it's one of the most tempting things is to say, what you need to do is get yourself fixed and that is going to end up with absolutely no <laughs> response at all might even get people's backs up i would suggest that the main thing is to build relationships and if you um if, if you think about a teacher perhaps feeling very insecure it can sometimes feel really hard when you know that they're they're not doing what they're supposed to be and your kid's suffering from it. But if you can find something positive and say, it was really great the way you did this. You know, I heard about something similar. Somebody was doing something like that when I heard about this training that Down Syndrome UK is offering. Would you be interested in talking with them about this great thing you're doing? And it sort of builds their confidence perhaps that maybe they've got something that they're doing okay at, but then opens up that opportunity to explore further. And nothing succeeds like success. It's an old cliche, but it's sort of true. You know, if you're feeling okay about your, what you're doing, you're more inclined to want to find out more about it. Um, it's a sort of a bit of psychology that I think is helpful. Thanks, Rhonda. Um, anybody else? on the panel. Sarah. Having people within the local authority committed really, really helps. Um, people that schools can trust who, who sort of go in and support, but um, support and also um, 
link people to other schools, um, link parents with other parents, uh, and and build the support network. So, as you say, creating links, creating links between teachers, especially. You know, it's often um, often teachers will only have one or two children with that type of complex need. Um, and so um, I think that having advocates within the local authority it, it, it is a really wonderful thing. Thanks, Sarah. Um, I'm very aware of time, so I'm just going to quickly check with Abby if she's found out anything about um, homeschooling. And then I'm going to come to each of you in turn and ask you for your final sort of key message based on the session. Um, and then I'm going to ask Carol as well to give her views to close the session too. So Abby, over to you first of all. Thanks, Sharon. So I have emailed the um, person who asked the question, uh, uh, replied to them and said to email me tomorrow because I have found, you know, an amount of information um, which I'd love to share with anyone interested in hearing more. Um, I remember from when I spoke about this before, um, if you have an EHCP, choosing to electively home educate means that the local authority no longer has a legal duty to secure special educational provision. Um, you know, the most obvious one being speech and language therapy, um, because the parents are deemed to be making their own suitable alternative arrangements. Um, and so there's another option, which is called education otherwise than at school, which the um, questioner may well have heard of if you're homeschooling. Um, and in that case, the local authority is still responsible for continuing to secure and fund that kind of provision. So that's one of the main um, sort of considerations um, in homeschooling. Um, and I think, and so there's a, there's a lot more to to say about it and, and other, you know, information from um, a range of organisations. So email in um, if, you, if you'd like to hear more. Um, but I think, you know, after reflecting on it, the advice would be the same anyway, wouldn't it? I'm looking at Jill, which is that, you know, you can still take our, whoever's teaching your child, um, watch our appropriate um, training webinar because you're still trying to, um, have them reach the progressive target from where their level currently is so that, you know, the the advice is still the same for education. Jill. Yeah, and teaching reading is teaching reading and teaching maths is teaching maths and, you know, opportunities of making friendships are opportunities of making friendships and they're the same as for other children. Obviously, yeah, you can... Uh, you know, there are some other things to work out, but it's essentially the same. So email in. Yes, please email in. Um, Abby, would you be able to just put in the chat for everybody, so not the Q&A, but the chat, um, just the info, email address, and maybe the helpline telephone number, um, just for anybody who's looking for any individual um, advice at the moment, then I'm sure Abby and the rest of the team would be delighted to hear from you. Um, so we're just going to draw the session to a close by asking everybody on the panel um, to give their key message relating to inclusion um, based on what we've talked about this evening. So I'm going to start with Nicole this time. Um, I think my key message would be to schools and if this is an audience of parents, for them to take back to their schools that there absolutely is room in the system to be flexible and responsive and do something different and still you know get your get your outcomes that you want and still um meet all statutory requirements and still get through an offstead if that's what they're motivated by that you can absolutely do all of those things and and get the outcomes that you want and have the school that you want by being flexible and responsive and open to diversity and willing to be reflective and willing to change. And I think that the exam factory, it's absolutely true, but it's based on misconception. 
Thank you, Nicole. And Jill? Um, make people comfortable, so that's the children and their families, and um, do it, really. Just do it. <laughs> Try it. <laughs> That's pinched from um, an our voice session, isn't it? Or oh, one, well, just do it. That was one of the people who, with um, Down syndrome when we were talking about ed inclusive education. Do Absolutely. It. it was, just do it. Yeah. The, the great pleasure of meeting our voice and talking to all the, um, the members about education and inclusion. And that was one of the key messages was just, just do it. So um, thank you for reminding us of that. Jill. Um, Rhonda, your key message just to draw this to a close. You know, being part of these sorts of groups, that's the way to just keep the, the information circulating and supporting, but also being kind to each other. It, you know, it's a tough gig, but it's also pretty tough for teachers. And so um, sometimes um, they can feel like no matter how hard they try, it's not good enough. So just um, remembering to honour them and their contributions, that can be great. And because I can't help myself, don't forget, you can find out a lot about inclusive education at the World Down Syndrome Congress, <laughs> which we'll see you all at in Brisbane next year. <laughs> Wonderful. That would be lovely. Oh, I would love to come to Australia next year. Um, and um, Sarah? Um, I think for me, it's it's hearing from young people with Down syndrome about what they value um, about schools, and hearing their their pride in um, their school experience, and also the priorities that they show us, the priorities of um, recognizing um, things that go well, the 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 value on friendship, the value on on um, liking people in your class, your teachers um, are considered as um, part of your friendship group, for example. Um, there's many lovely things that when we ask um, young people with Down syndrome about their school, we think, wow, yes, it's worth it. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I'm happy. I don't think there is a recording from Lindsay for this, but I just wondered whether you would like to say something. Well, um, in terms of your response, because you've been listening and, and joining in this evening too, which we're very grateful for. Yeah, it's wonderful to listen. I can confirm that um, when Lindsay and I had finished our conversation, I said, so Lindsay, is there anything else you'd like to say? And she said, nope, I think that's it. And and I think <laughs> I think that's right. You know, she spoke about training and um, she spoke about having the same opportunities as her brother who doesn't have Down syndrome and her friends who don't have Down syndrome. Um, and, and that's right. And, and I enjoyed um, what Rhonda said about um, everyone working together, you know, schools and families and everyone else involved. Um, and, and even if, um, you know, anyone is irritated by anything that another party has said to remember that we're all there to support the person who has Down syndrome and, and trying to put those kinds of feelings aside and think, okay, maybe that communication wasn't ideal that we just had. What can we do next to support the person who has Down syndrome and try to always bring it back to that? Wonderful, thank you. Absolutely. It's all about relationships and working together, isn't it? And so I think that is up at the deep. So I'm going to ask Carol um, for some final words and to close the session. If that's okay, Carol. Yeah. I thank you, Sharon. I I think it is it is about winning hearts and minds. And we need a lot more clones of Nicole and her team in good old West Yorkshire. <laughs> I think there'd be quite a lot of people who's thinking about moving there. But <laughs> Thank you very much um, to all our speakers this evening. Um, it's been great to have you, and I hope you'll you will join us again through our through our campaign because I think webinars like this are really important for not only for um, the audience to be able to put questions to you, listen to you and put questions to you, but for us gathering information. 
along the way because we do need to gather a lot more information and we need to have a lot more people i'm coming back to nicole again but we need a lot more people like you getting involved because that's the way we will give teachers the the confidence that they need because as everyone has said tonight on the panel it's not that difficult you just have to get on and do it and thank you to all of our participants this evening because it's been really valuable having your comments and questions and i hope i hope you've enjoyed it and i hope you'll join us again <laughs>